make social media social the clue is in the fucking name so welcome to part two where we carry on an amazing wonderful wisdom filled conversation with a boy Colin Campbell at Canberra Conversations. So much wisdom to take from this. I'm going to be taking notes and rewatching it myself. So part two, buckle up, get the popcorn ready and enjoy. Yeah. Use social media to find like-minded people. How did we start speaking? Social, social media, media, bro. Okay. Come on. Now, by showing up on social media, working towards the version you're going to be, you're going to attract more people and we can be uh, corny about this, who are vibrating at a more similar frequency to you, who are aiming towards some of the things that you're aiming towards, and you can network with them as well. Now, don't be the weird guy that's DMing some guy that's never going to want to meet hey, up with you, who's never heard of you, yeah? It's a, bit, it's a bit weird. But back in the day, maybe like 2017, when I was first starting my fitness Instagram, I was meeting up with people to train all the time. I met up with, let's say, 40 people four or five of them are still pretty close friends because we're on a similar wavelength. Yep. We're interested in health and fitness, but we're also talking about business. We're also talking about sales. We're also talking about philosophy. We're also talking about politics. Mm -hmm. And we wind up on those things. And I spend time with a lot of those a lot of those guys still. And that was really, really helpful as well. And those are people that I connected with through a shared interest on social media because I was willing to share my interests on social media. Because yep. you can be a an observer on social media. There's a stat that 99% of people on LinkedIn, and I appreciate that's not a platform you guys are super focused on, are not posting. 1% are creating. Instagram is a little bit skewed because people do just shit post on Instagram. They post yep. a photo of their dog or their dinner or whatever, yep. and that's cool. But if you show up on Instagram posting stuff that you really care about and start to follow mm. other people that are maybe at a similar stage of their journey or maybe one or two steps ahead of you, they can become your network. And you might not become best friends. I was saying again today to you, Jack, I've got people that... I talk loads to about particular things, but we don't talk about some of the personal stuff that's going on in my life or going on in their life. Yeah. In fact, I might not know that they're 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 getting married next next year or whatever else. I might not know they've got a kid on the way because we just don't talk about that yeah. stuff. But they are like my tribe and I spend time talking to them about particular things that we can support each other with. Yeah. And I really think from that perspective, you can change your network through one, the stuff you put out there, and two, outreach, meet up with people. It's not a commitment. You go for a coffee, you go for a gym session. I mean, gym session was easy for me because fitness was something that was interesting for to sure. me. You might be listening to this and be like, oh, I'm not interested in that. Okay, find somebody that likes to go climbing or golfing or tennis, whatever it is, something like that. And something that isn't really formal, like let's go for lunch or let's go for dinner. That feels like like you're asking some meeting. Day, yeah, for yeah, sure. 100%. And see, see as well, when we're thinking about, the reason why I asked that question is because there's going to be some people on listen to this. And the people that are listening to this is what, an hour and five minutes in, there are people that want to do better with their life, right? And people around you might not be like that. And the reason why I want you to have faith in becoming the person you want to be, that person attracts people like that person you want to be, is because it does genuinely happen. And the people around you right now, don't cut them off. Like Carl said, don't cut them completely off. Because you need to analyze those people. And Jay Shetty is a really good speaker. Uh, and he spoke about the four C's in a relationship. So consistency care competence and character so consistency is they're consistently there for you i'll go through this quite quickly care is obviously they care about you uh character is they allow you to be the best version of yourself they, they bring out your best character and competence is they can kind of help you in areas that you can't help yourself in right if people are injured right now they care about you and they're consistently in your life but they don't really bring out that new character and they don't really give you any kind of competence to become better doesn't mean you need to cut them off, right? But just know that the time that you spend with them will end up being a little bit more limited. Expect it so that you're not disappointed. You don't feel guilty for not giving them your time. Because as Cole said, as you elevate, if you elevate like this and they stay on this same level coming along with this, the gap will be created, right? At some point, they might rise up and meet you, right? And you might see them at weddings, you might see them at social events. But just know the gap will be created by the new person you're becoming and don't feel guilty about it try and expect it and also try and have faith that they still will be in your life but new people that will be on this level will appear and you will attract them and you're saying it's corny about vibration and frequencies like that is what that's the shit i fucking i, I really live by that stuff obviously shout out sam cavana you're gonna have a chat with him soon he said he was sitting laughing at my face in my face because he's pure christian like re religious he was saying that universe bullshit and he came and sat next to me at the event we're at and he was like here i just attract you just attracted me to sit next to you like proper rip no i sent me right but i definitely believe that 
how you act, like what you give out is what you get back. So if you're giving out this pure, authentic, high-functioning, successful person, you're probably going to attract or definitely going to attract someone on that similar wavelength. But right now, you might be doubting to kind of make that move and become that new person because the people around you just aren't on that level and you're scared to let go of them. But you don't need to let them completely go, is what I've just said. From a vibration perspective, I don't necessarily buy into all the science behind it but your actions are all aligned with that as well so your actions are all aligned with the kind of people that you want to attract now don't get me wrong somebody sitting down next to you at an event and stuff like that like you sure. didn't vibrate for that to happen i don't believe that and like, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's saying that uh, comedically as well yeah, yeah. but by being a person of interest on instagram and posting content or doing things in your day-to-day -day life that is in alignment with the person you want to be you will attract those people and whether it's the vibrations whether it's the universe it's probably just you showing up and doing the thing that you said you were going to do that interests them and they're like, I can get on with him. Relatable, yeah. He, he interests me. He's a cool guy. We've got shared interests. That's so positive and that's completely cool. Whereas, like, yeah, it, it, whatever allows it to happen, let's not worry about that. But the fundamental of it is you're creating the opportunities for these things to happen as well. You're going in the right rooms. You're showing up in social media in the right way. You're joining the right networking events. You're messaging the right people. You're showing up continually and doing it for a period of time, not just suddenly becoming like the guy you want to go become overnight because that, people see through that shit as well as if you constantly jump about from what you want to be. So yeah. completely agree with you there, no, And I and thought about this today. Like if me and Jack weren't people that were out there on Instagram and were dead authentic and we had this profile, you wouldn't be sitting in this chair right now on our podcast. As someone that's credible in the podcast space, you've got mad fucking guests on, you wouldn't be giving us your time right now if we hadn't have taken those actions. And if we glued ourselves to who our friends were around us at the point, maybe five, six years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here speaking to a successful guy here um, because we would have limited ourselves to like holding on to who were around at that time. Do you can, know what I mean? can I say you showed up consistently as well? So I get invited on podcasts quite a lot and I get people pitching themselves to come on my podcast as well. And sometimes it's done in a really bad way. Sometimes it's done in a really good way and people yep. have said yes to people. But you guys have done it consistently and consistently shown up in a way that showed that you were who you said you were. I think yep. we first met in person at the Financial Freedom Summit. Yep. Yes. And then we met at the Growth Cares event and then we've met at different gyms, stuff like that. We've bumped For into sure. each other. And each time you've just continued to reinforce that you are good who guys you are so you are you are who you say you are yep. you're interested in the things that you told me you were interested in because people can put on a mask anytime and be like oh, i really want to talk to you about this and then you scratch me to the surface they don't have a clue what they're talking about yep. and they're actually just saying that to get your to get your interest or to start a conversation or because they have ulterior motives as well yeah, and that's something that happens a lot of the time so that's why sometimes people have their guard up hard when somebody tries to get into their circle yeah well authenticity is so so key to everything can i speak yeah. Can I quickly say, right? Again, who you want to be and that kind of goal that you've got is probably who you are deep inside, right? So that's the authentic version of yourself. Just start being that fucking person because you cannot go wrong. I said this in my story the other day. If you're authentic all the time, right? Whatever you do is completely from you. So the example I used was because a lot of people will copy you. If you're authentic and out there, people will sit and take little nuggets from Cole had a good has a good podcast, right? People will take like things that he's done in his podcast right but because he's done it first because it authentically came from him everyone else is copying him they're all a step behind what he's doing because he's always authentic and being him so if you're just authentic you cannot really go wrong and you're going to be given back what you put out which is obviously authenticity and people around you that are authentic exactly so real recognize real the, the way you act will be a direct correlation of who you are around because the authenticity that we've shown consistently towards call or the call is seen has allowed him to then connect with us so you'll very likely find that a fake cunt will f hang around with other fake cunts like it's a very common correlation that if you're faking yourself you're going to start to attract fake people and it is dishonesty and security that will help build that fakeness and then you're around fake people so yeah auth authenticity is one of the most important things but to add to the the four c's that you said about jay shetty mm -hmm. it's also important to note that you will very unlikely find all four C's in one person. Did you say that? You will unlikely find. Yeah, yeah. You it's very, very unlikely. It's it, very it unlikely. Because I've got people in my life and I, like I me, person, I'm personally like that. Yeah, like me and Kyle are twins. Like, we came out the same fucking egg. Two little sperm racing down the fucking wherever it was Jack to get into the egg. I get there a minute before because I'm a fucking G. But <laughs> regardless of that, me and Kyle give each other in a relationship those four C's just because we're like the same fucking person basically like he's the voice in my head as a human that's how it works so obviously I've got the four C's and I'm very grateful for that and I feel like that's why we're so ahead of our years because we have that reinforcement but 
It's very important to note that you may only get the one out of the four C's from someone. You may only get care from someone, but not the character, the consistency and the competence. But it's important to know that everything you expect from someone, you will you typically not get. It's about finding the people that piece everything together. Do you know what I mean? Building a network. 100% and that's where networking comes in so you will have people that fill voids in your life for different reasons you can't expect one person to give you everything yeah 100% and me and Jack obviously saying out loud on a podcast to a screen we're going to be multi-millionaires right there's going to be a little bit of us that goes oh fuck like this person's not trying to do the same thing do we give them any time at all well the genuinely care about us they're consistently there if we message them so obviously that person has a little bit of something in our life that we shouldn't just let go of do you know what i mean so right now again you might think fuck i just cut all my friends off to like that cunt's want to be a fucking bin man like that's his actual goal in life which is not bad right but it's not like horrendous to be like that but because you want to be a millionaire and he wants to be a bin man doesn't mean to just fucking pie him off if he consistently cares about you keep that person in your life because most people in life give you fucking zero of the c's like they don't give you even one so i i i have um i have friends that we talk about different stuff amongst us and with my personality type where i can be quite serious and quite focused all the time we were talking about switching off weren't we jack during yep. the gym today yep i have friends that i switch off from brain body business with and talk about rangers because we're all rangers fans and yep. we're, we we like talking about that and that's my fun time i have a podcast that i listen to i'm a subscriber to heart and hand i'm on their patreon site and i listen to that podcast sometimes very rarely when i'm getting in the mood to do something important yeah but i'll listen to it to switch off from how can i how can i improve my my sales capability how can i improve my podcasting how can i improve my brain how can i improve my body i have switching off from that and i'm not sure which of the four c's those friends give me but having some form of light entertainment in your life as well is important but and this is not to give you a prescriptive diagnosis of what percentage it should be it's not the majority for me that's not what i'm doing all the time it's a small percentage of my time where i'm talking about football i'm talking about rangers and i have friends that i talk about that with don't get me wrong some of those friends can like to talk to me about their careers or their businesses as well but some of them they just want to talk to me about who's playing up front that's all they care about. And that's totally cool. But I switch between that and the other people that serve me in those other areas as well. And I think it is important in this life where we're all very serious to think about fun too. Yep. But so many people have the dial twisted so too far the other way so that they're talking about girls partying and football all the time. 90% of the time and 10% of the time they're like, oh yeah, I might end up actually trying to go for that promotion at work and to do that, I should probably learn to public speak a little bit better. I should probably work on how I set up my PowerPoints and how I present them in work or whatever it is that they're doing. Is that there any conflict shift. though? Sorry for interrupting. Is there any conflict in your head when you're sick? Because personally for me, right, I put a wee, a wee meme on my, my close friends the other day and it was like you switch off for a second and it's like your fucking head's like nearly exploding because you're like trying to rest but something in the back of your head's making you feel guilty. Like, Do you ever get any kind of friction between actually having that downtime? And yeah, like, of course. Of course, um, that's a blessing and a curse. It'll make you work harder than anyone else, but it'll also not allow you to enjoy the, the downtime. Yeah, well. yeah. yeah exactly. So one of the things that I did is I have a time box diary. Yeah. So my day is broken down into segments and there is conscious downtime built in. So my training is scheduled in for an hour and a half, two hours typically to allow you to drive either side of it, to allow me to have a chat at the end of the workout. You saw David Lloyd, there was loads of people there that we were talking to, like four or five different people came and said hello and we talk to yep. that's all built in um tonight for example after i go back i will not be thinking about any form of work i might reply to instagram dms that's not put in my it's not put in my in my time box but i might do that and then i'm going to read and i'm going to journal i'm going to get myself to get myself to bed the football is scheduled in so i think we next play there's a couple of weeks break but if for example it's at three o'clock on saturday it's booked out for three hours that i'm either going to the game or I'm watching it on, on on TV and that's booked out and I'm not thinking about podcasting or anything else during that time as well. And I have accepted that's downtime. I was out for dinner on the Friday before New Year's Eve from six o'clock. Wasn't, didn't post on Instagram, didn't show up on Instagram, didn't think about my next guest that's coming up, didn't think about my proposal that I've just been preparing today since I've got back to work after the Christmas break. I just put it away because i agreed with myself i have a contract with myself that the time that i've assigned to the other things has been assigned to those particular things so yep. just having like really conscious breaks between work and play is really important as well and if you schedule the play it also works better with the type of personalities that we've got where you're like shit man whereas of course if you switch off at 
three o'clock on a Friday and you've not done any of the work you said you were going to do <laughs> yeah, up yeah, until yeah. then, you're going to be guilty as hell yeah. because you deserve to be guilty. You didn't do the thing you said you were going to do. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say that. See, having that intentional downtime as well, right? Where is that? It's mostly at the end of the day or after some kind of effort. So it comes back to the start of the fucking podcast. When you're training your brain to have effort involved in getting that reward, getting that dopamine release, I mean, calls reinforcing it by actually scheduling intentional downtime on a calendar right you might not be as specific as that but having that downtime earned and with effort involved again it's, it's taking you away from the short-term gratification and just always getting that downtime without any fucking effort involved do you know what i mean yeah exactly that and like what i'm saying is extreme but my personality is extreme in that regard 100. in terms of the amount of work that i'm willing to do and you're saying switch off for a minute and there's a conflict your personality is probably similar aligned so you would benefit at least for a short period of scheduling in that time where you say to yourself oh i'm gonna make sure that i i, I book in that i'm having a break between six and eight tonight and then eight o'clock i'll maybe do a wee bit of tidying up stuff if it helps if it helps me switch off before i go to bed yeah. and then i'm then i'm chilling because that's the thing i a lot of what we see from influential characters in the space, like Andrew Tate, for example, I saw a video recently about how he said men don't have to enjoy life. And I, and I started to go around in my head and I was like, should I be taking rest? Should I be actually having downtime where I'm just filling my time with pleasure and, I, and I've earned that time? And obviously, for starters, I think Andrew Tate is severely autistic. I feel like that's why he can just keep fucking going. So I'm not... I wouldn't say artistic so like i like enjoying life a little bit um so i feel like it's quite destructive not to give yourself time for rest because with work must come rest i always go around in my head about trying to keep a balance in my life but when we think about balance it's like right cool two hours of work two hours of rest it's not going to work because you need to work more than you rest so i've started to find balance and contrast so on a daily or weekly basis i just make sure if i'm deep in work i will be deep in rest at some point and that's where i feel the balance it's not so much in maybe the frequency or the time it's more in when i work at some point i'm gonna have to rest and obviously i saw a little nice little bit of content the other day of this chinese guy speaking and he was saying like life is all about give or take left or right in and out up and down there needs to be uh, an equal and opposite reaction to that action and rest is the equal and opposite reaction to work do you know what i mean so. it's called polarity and the pendulum always swings back yep. oh, well, yeah so some uh, andrew tate speaking speaking in extreme there in terms of work all the time the pendulum is right at the very far hand side of the spectrum yeah S at some point maybe not for him but for most people it has to swing back a little bit more maybe not all the way maybe not even halfway maybe even maybe it's 75 percent yeah but for most people it's probably going to have to be somewhere in that equilibrium it cannot be all the way to one side yeah and i think you do see people work and work and work and work all the time and then burn out i'm actually a little bit run down at the moment anyone that's watching this visually you'll see i've my skin my skin's broken out a little bit when typically my skin's really really good yep. but i've kind of been full pelt since i got back from dubai and then over the festive period it was so social but i was still trying to tick a lot of the, the other boxes as well not even that just the hours that i had assigned available to me i was having to <laughs> i was having yeah, to use yeah. them because there was so much social on and i was totally willing to go and be social and be in the moment and not be on my phone doing things that i was going to do when i got home um, and my sleep was disrupted and everyone knows how uh, fundamental sleep is to performance so they should they should do by now but uh knowing that when i've pushed it a little bit too far sometimes my body will start to show signs of that as well yep. and knowing that that means that this weekend for example i have a podcast and have a little bit of work but then saturday evening from five o'clock after and i have some training booked in as well with a friend again i i uh, quite like a uh, like almost stacking activities yeah so a social catch-up could be training with a friend a social catch-up could be going for a walk things that i'm going to do anyway are Couple pretty up. valuable to to do that at once it's about it's called stacking or bundling uh, and it's a really really good time management cool. uh, effect and i know that on sunday i'm going to be so much more recharged to start working hard again because i'm taking most of saturday apart from one podcast away from like the graft and the focus yeah sick when it comes to optimizing all areas of your life relationships is a huge part that i'm still trying to perfect and obviously i'm still young so i'll learn over the course of my life and just experiencing life but when it comes to business obviously you're running the podcast stuff full-time business basically the way you run it high level corporate jobs so much responsibility the way you need to systemize your life has to be optimal to achieve what you're trying to achieve 
we spoke a little bit about the Michelangelo effect earlier in the podcast and earlier today. When it comes to relationships, what do you try and keep in it to to not affect your business? I've got relative experience in this, but I'm by no means an expert. In yeah, just your form. opinion. I'm, yeah, I'm single at 31, for example, but I'm also highly selective and I come from a place of relative abundance where I feel like I've dated girls that were right in some regards, but not right in others. So I've been willing to walk away from something that's not been yep. a- able to get to where, where I want it to get to. Probably for both of us as well. They might have been like charmed by the initial phases of going up with somebody who's quite charismatic and quite high energy and quite successful and ticks a lot of their boxes, but yep. maybe they weren't willing to put up with the the hours, the restlessness and whatever else that, that, that comes with that as well. I think there, there was a phrase that uh, I learned recently, be dull and mundane in your personal life so that you can be violent and aggressive in your business life. And that's basically thinking about having peace at home so that you can go into the war that is business and the battlefield that is business. Because if you're using bandwidth to put out fires at home because you've got uh, a, a, a turbulent relationship where there's fighting and arguing and stress that comes in that, you don't need that if you're really going to try and go into the business world and, and, and be your best self. And that's not to say that your relationship's always going to be sunshine and rainbows. There's going to be difficult conversations. There's going to be yeah. challenges. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be things that you know that you've not done as well as you could have and you know that she's not done as well as, you, as she could have. And you have to have that hard conversation. But it shouldn't be, and this is maybe maybe, maybe poor advice because I've walked away from an, a number of different situations. If it's really, really hard at the start, like crazy hard at the start, like turbulent, it's only going to get worse because I've always found that anyone yep. I've dated has put on like their best front and their best self in the same way that we as guys do yep. for the first few months. Mm. And if that's not working, oh, well, it's going to be a problem after that, isn't it? Because then the real kind of true self is going to start to come to the surface and it's going to be a nightmare. Yeah, it can't be completely fucked up, but you did say something earlier regarding the fact that when you've got a relationship, it's a, is it Mike Angelo, Michael? Yeah, let's get into that. Yeah. yeah, so you say how you said it, because how you said it in relation to a relationship, it will probably allow a lot of people to accept the little things that aren't completely right and also accept that things do need to get better and then take ownership over getting better rather than taking it personally. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so this, a is, of, this, yeah. Is a, this is a concept that I'm borrowing and uh, we were talking about um, how valuable it is that we have access to all these different creators and, and, yep. and writers. I borrowed this from Whitney Cummins, who's a comedian and she was on chris williamson's podcast who's the host of modern wisdom one of my favorite shows and one of the most supportive people for me getting started my show as well they were speaking about when you meet someone of course there's got to be like some fundamental compatibilities that's what i'm speaking about there if it's like crazy from the start and she's got a load of trauma that she can't deal with and she's taken out on you or you are really insecure and you just can't let her do anything then that's never going to work okay but if you both meet you effectively are treating each other like big blocks of marble that are moldable by each other and you can chip away at the edges and rough and, and, and the rough parts and start to hone it down into the perfect partner for each other and you're constantly working on each other to try and improve themselves that's not to say you're like i'm going to change everything about you i'm going to ch- or he, she's going to change everything about you but it's to understand that there's elements of always working on each other and things that you can both do better and you can get towards as well because none of us are infallible like there's going to be things that you've done in relationships or even like like more casual things that you've had that you've thought yeah i probably didn't hold myself to the, the highest possible standard there how i conducted myself or what i said or how i like how i communicated just wasn't quite right yep. and that's completely fine but when you both get together both accept the fact that you can both chip away at some of those rough edges and work on them yep. albeit there's of course red but red flags and barriers that you will simply not cross but accept there's probably some small things there's going to be some give and take to try and get to where you want to get towards because this is though you're you're both working on the same masterpiece. A lot of relationships, it's like on opposite sides. Like you're against each other. When How rela- often do you see the girl want to fix the bad boy? Ye- she ne- she's never going to do it properly. No. She's yeah. going to try. Oh, I tamed him. You tamed one part of him. You don't know what else you what else is lying underneath the surface. Yeah. Equally, you get the guy who's like, oh yeah, the really promiscuous girl, for example, I've managed to wife her. Like Logan Paul. We're all seeing that. Yeah. That person, we? yeah. I mean, God help him. <laughs> I don't know. Jesus fucking Christ! Um, yeah, for the streets, brother. yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah, she is like, yeah. The, the videos I've been seeing, it's fucking, it's insane. But yeah, hundred percent. I feel like when it comes to relationships, to optimize your business life and just life in general, you need to make sure the relationships that you have 
you're both on the same side of trying to improve it because a lot of the things that you say constructive to them or they might say to you are taken personally and then starts to cause even more conflict as opposed to driving the same car, making sure that you're going forward in the same direction. Do you know what I mean? You're a, t- you're a team. You totally are. And you were asking about like the element of like single versus relationship when it comes to like, optimizing business and like across the board of my uh, my guests. Yep. Many of them have built things while single, but many of them have built things while they've been in a relationship as well. And they've had somebody in the background supporting and enabling them to yep. do so. Yep. And they've been pulling in the same direction, not pulling apart. Yeah. And there is an element of sometimes you might progress at a different speed from your partner and that's definitely happened to me before as well where maybe there's been things that i've worked on and the person i've been with at the time has either been uncomfortable that i'm working on those things and been like oh are you trying to like become too good for me or whatever that is and you see it uh, you maybe see it with some of your clients when they lose weight for example and their partner's like oh wow like why have you done this like you basically they've moved out of your range in the dating market because they've got more jacked and like they're getting more interest from girls (laughs) because they've become a higher value man that can happen as well and that's a dangerous position to be in but try and bring that person on the journey with you and support them Um, and we were also talking about ways to like reinforce positive behaviors between the two of you and there's there's two ways there's the carrot or there's a stick now the stick is obviously a negative where you hit somebody the carrot's like the dangling of the carrot that somebody goes towards and that's just praising positive traits that you enjoy about somebody as well yep. and that's not even something that maybe they don't do it very often but if they if it's something they do often and you really value it in the relationship we talked about communication during this podcast haven't we communicate it like yeah, what are the things that you like about that person and i've dated girls that were really big on the love languages mm. and some of that's quite corny it's maybe uh, up your street Kyle, in terms of <laughs> stuff. but really but, well yeah exactly <laughs> but the, the the five different love languages um words of affirmation acts of service physical touch what else have I got? Um, I'll try and remember them, but there's lots of different ways that people express love, love and yeah. people get value from that. And different people have different ways that they get value from that. So understanding how you show up in relationships and what you like, and then using those words of affirmation to say what you enjoy about the relationship, it's a really good way to reinforce the things that you do. So I was given an example of like, I really like how present you are when we go out for dinner. You're never on your phone. How many people can say that? Not very many. Yeah. So when you say it, guess what? you yourself will probably do it more and they'll do it as well and you'll have a much better time like my worst nightmares when i look around the restaurant and the couples are all sitting on their phones yeah, as well yeah. if you've got two hours together that day or maybe that week if you're really stretched and like you don't live together yet mm. then let's make the most of that time as well and presence and uh, quality time that's another that's another uh, love language quality time is one of my highest ones like if i'm with someone i'm with them i'm trying not to get engaged in other things yeah 100 percent on the line of relationships, when it comes to like a woman in your life, as you said, single or coupled, you've met people on your podcast that have been able to build with or without. I feel like with girls being so emotional, it does take for the man to be quite aware of that. And as you said, when there's good things happening, you are praising that because men can go on their day and they can just fucking plow through hundreds of work. Some people can, some people can't. But the ultra successful people do without any sense of gratification. A lot of girls do seek that little bit of reassurance, that little bit of gratification. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because of how heavily emotional women are to have to deal with kids and all that stuff. So I, I fully believe in traditional roles. I feel like, and it's not misogynistic, it's purely based on providing for the person you're with financially and physically and all these other things. And then the woman will play her part in building the family home and building the, like taking more care Support of the kids. Structure. When Yeah. When you're out fucking the breadwinner out there making the money, you come back and she's holding it down. Like, I love that. And I feel like a lot of people sway from that because of, as we talk about society, just corrupting people's fucking minds. A lot of people don't see the value in that and they think it's then bringing women down etc you need to find a woman that wants to do that but i feel like if everyone is accepting and w- like wanting of the the, the traditional roles etc then it's probably one of the most optimal relationships relationship dynamics to have because it's so consistent there's roles to be played it's like a football team the striker doesn't just go out one day and expect oh, i'm gonna jump in goals today he's a fucking striker he's gonna be setting up and scoring the goals the defender knows what they're doing so i feel like with relationships you need to know your role in that relationship and as long as you know that the consistency can remain and you can keep continue to build the relationship I think consistency is one of the most attractive traits in anyone that i spend time 100%. with whether that's friends or females relationships yeah. as well and knowing that somebody's going to do things in a relatively similar way all the time as well now don't get me wrong in the early stages of a relationship it's actually quite important for a guy to stand out to be 
a little bit less predictable to not always be like Mr. Steady. And yeah. you have to, that, that's, that's like a principle that some of the dating coaches have had on the podcast have talked to me about as well. Because if you are Mr. Steady and Mr. Reliable, they, they can get bored quite quickly as well. Because mm. any good looking, high value girl is getting way more inbound inquiry than we are getting as guys, no matter no matter how high level you are. So you do need to stand out in some regards. But having someone that consistently shows up and is level, is calm, is stoic, is a really good quality for anyone to be around. My friends are like that. Any girl that I've dated successfully has been like that as well. They've just behaved in a way that has been expected and have consistently done it as well. You don't have high days and low days that are just completely out of whack. Now, that's not to say that you don't have days that are things sure. are wrong and you get emotional, but that you show up in a way that's consistently regulated and like you're, 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 uh, you're relatively predictable in terms of how, how you're going to speak to someone. Yeah, that needs to be the case in every area of your life. When we're talking about being authentic, being authentic makes that a lot easier because then there's no real kind of act put on. Like if you're always authentic, the consistency in your actions will always be there. Like the consistency will never go away because you're not trying to, you're never going to get caught out because you're never trying to put on an actor. As you said, some people speak to you, they've got a, like an ulterior motive. They're like, oh, call, see you on podcast. I'm really interested in doing a podcast. And then you ask them, oh, so when are you going to do a podcast? And they're like, ah, oh, fucking. And then six months later, a year later, they've not done a podcast. You know what I mean? So uh, consistency is a lot easier when you're authentic and you're just true to who you are, true to who you are now. And yeah, you, you know who you want to be. Do you know what I mean? One of, sorry Jack regarding authenticity one of the big things that I learned from Chris Williamson early on he was the first guest in my podcast he got really close to a guy called Aubrey Marcus who is a he was a CEO of Onnit which he had yeah, like a multi-figure um, multi-million pound um, dollar sorry exit and he said that the persona is incapable of love so if you're playing an act so say for example, I decided to become the Aldi or the Costco Chris Williamson, or you, uh, Kyle, decided to be the the Aldi or the the Costco version of like a personal uh, personal trainer, online coach that you really look up to. You would get the praise from the audience and the validation from the customer base, but it wouldn't feel true because you wouldn't be doing your version of it. Yes, you can borrow traits that you admire about somebody else or things that you like that you see somebody else do you can be like oh i can do my take on it 100%. But you make sure that it's the kyle richie take on it or it's the jack richie take on it or it's the colin campbell take on it and it's not an impersonation because yep. you will not feel the love and support that get, get, comes your way if it wasn't truly how you would how you are like you i could show up and i could do so for example one of the fastest ways to grow the podcast is me having on really naughty cunts yeah. having on loads of gangsters, controversy loads of killers and growing the show that way and massive props and respect to the shows that have done that they've done amazing things and i really respect them for that but that wasn't my area of interest yep. i was interested in improving brain body business so i interviewed people in that field yep. over and over and over again and yes it's slower because less people were immediately drawn to that to yep. be like oh that sounds amazing i'm gonna listen to that i'm gonna share that i'm gonna shout it out whereas if i'd had a guy on who was like a reformed drug dealer or killer or whatever and he'd come out of prison and now done this and done that and he had some really naughty stories from back in the day that would do numbers on youtube because that's just how the algorithm works and it's just what people are interested in their downtime they're yep. more willing to listen to that and that's totally cool but if i did that and i got a million plays in a podcast i wouldn't feel a thing or well, i would feel hollow completely hollow it's not authentic yeah. obviously sometimes you do things that are growth strategy orientated on podcasts that you know will pay off in the longer term so you might ask a question that's a bit more clickbaity or something like that as well but i can i can live with that what i can't live with is pursuing a total other genre in order to purely chase metrics numbers and and revenue yep. because I, that wouldn't i wouldn't last i'd burn out i wouldn't want to do it i wouldn't do the the 9 p.m on a sunday sending out cold dms to people on linkedin and instagram to come on the podcast that i'm really really interested in yep. because i would just be like fuck it i'll just speak to someone else next week maybe maybe i'll maybe i'll, maybe I'll miss this week's episode yep because like with that i feel like authenticity going back to that is so key and how you deliver your message so if your podcast what would you say your podcast is based around self-development self-development so i would say our podcast is more of a lifestyle podcast so concepts of life maybe business principles etc but it's not to say that I won't have, we won't have guests in the future that are just all about mad fucking stories. Like I've got a lot of clients, heroin dealers, all these mad things that I could bring them on. Probably won't, probably won't come on and talk about being a fucking heroin dealer, but like people that could come on and bring a lot of controversy and, and numbers. But as you said, you can't really deviate too far from your you original could do message. It every week, mate. 
No. You would you wouldn't want to keep. Doing we would that. lose interest ourselves because it just becomes such an unauthentic thing. Uh, but one thing I wanted to ask you, like a viewer's question, I feel like a lot of people would want to know. When I said to you, I didn't really know what you'd done Instagram wise. No, sorry for your like job income, and obviously all I see on Instagram is the podcast. So I'm like, is this guy making all his money from podcasts or whatever? And obviously you're in a high paid, high responsibility corporate job with the intellect, with the mindset and the success that you have and everything you do why have you not gone outside of that you don't want to say nine to five but kind of like nine to five corporate job and started your own business why is that something you've not pursued when you have the mindset to do so i've not been in a rush and if we go back to the four currencies number one money is really strong in the area that i'm in number two freedom of time is not strong I'm working nine to five or I'm available around 40 hours a week to my client base and to, yep. to new customers. Freedom of location is pretty good. I'm based from home. I go out to clients, Manchester, Liverpool, London, Birmingham, stuff like that. But it's on my decision. Yep. Satisfaction and fulfillment is actually quite high in my role mm. because I came into a business unit that was doing about one million pounds of revenue, relatively successful. It had a lot of the different tools to be successful. What it was missing was the man to get the doors open, to close the deals, to structure the deals, to win the deals. And I did that. We've grown the business to 3.8 million this year over a two-year period. So that's, that's, us, that's us, like 1 million a year to 3.8 million a year is pretty special growth. That's and insane. I've been remunerated for that, but I've also felt the satisfaction of going and winning the deal, opening the door. People had never heard of my company before. They're like, oh, I'm not too sure. But then they trusted and bought into me. I followed up with action. I built the systems internally to make sure it all happened smoothly. We delivered on it. They introduced me to more customers and we bump, 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 bump. So I've not been running away from something. I, again, anyone that's a listener to my show will laugh when I mention this. Sometimes when we're pushing towards something, that's great, but we also need to be running away from something. And I'm going to bring an example up. Jordan Peterson names this study all the time. Yep. There's a rat. It has a coil on its tail measuring how hard it's going to pull. They waft the smell of cheese in front of him and they measure how hard it pulls towards the cheese. That's it going towards a goal. Yep. The second rat in the second study, coil on the tail. They waft the smell of cheese in front of him. He's pulling towards the cheese. Behind him, they waft the smell of a cat. He pulls twice as hard as the other rat. Mm. Why? Because you need to be running away from something that's painful towards pleasure as well. You cannot just always be working towards pleasure. That's why sometimes it's important to use your insecurities and your fallibility, your ego, to get, get away from something. So, so for me, I'm not running away from something at the moment, Jack. I'm uh, Comfort's a bad thing, I agree but I'm not in a rush. That's why I've not sold out with the podcast and I've done it in a way that I've wanted to do it and it's grown and grown and grown. I owe it to myself though and I owe it to my audience to offer more services to get closer to me because at the moment I've got my podcast masterclass so people who are wanting to scale and grow their own show and get it into a brilliant place, they can work on my course and go through that. That's one product. I owe it to have other products, whether it's on public speaking, whether it's on sales, whether it's on mindset, whether it's on just more lifestyle stuff. I owe it to my audience who really value what I've got to say and what I've like built up in terms of my experience yep. to work with me on a more close basis. And I will be doing that, but I'm not in a rush. I need to do that properly. There is a there is a need for me to do that and I have a responsibility to do that. And I recognize it's taken me too long to do that. But let's think about the right example. I'm not running away from anything at the moment, but I completely appreciate that I should be moving towards it faster. So you're not running away from anything. Should you be? Not at this moment in time, but I'll be pulling towards something that matters Why? Me. Why Why should you not be running away from something? Because I'm ticking a lot of the boxes that I'm happy with. So you don't feel like you need to run away from anything? No. Like you're, you're, I know because like the way I know you, you're fucking optimizing every area of your life without having to run away from anything. So you don't need that. And that's what you said about comfort's not amazing if you let it become too much. There's no comfort that's stopping you from what you're doing. So it's quite interesting to know because I feel like I'm running away from a lot of the financial struggle that we've experienced as, a, as like kids and stuff like that. I'm using a lot of that to go, fuck that. I want to be as free as I can be. I say multimillionaire. I said in the first podcast, it's not money orientated. It's freedom orientated. Yeah. I just want to be as free as I fucking can. So we are running away from not being in that financial position and obviously a few other things. So you would say that if you're if what you're chasing is strong enough you don't really need to run away from anything yeah have you heard of golden handcuffs no so i have relatively what's called golden handcuffs where yeah. i have a fiscal position that i'm chained to to some extent because i'm not willing to sacrifice the quality of lifestyle that i lead mm. to go and do my own thing okay. so my own thing needs to scale in the background 
to a level that I'm comfortable with, with the hours that I'm able to put into it. Mm. There's a rule, probably about 70% is the rule. This guy called Justin Welsh has that rule. Right. If you are side hustle, with the time that you're able to put into it, which is obviously going to be less than you can put into your day job, it's just not possible to put more sure. of my time into that because I actually have a, a set a hours. day job. Yeah. If that overtook and got to 70%, then imagine you put those 40, 50 hours into the thing, then it's going to obviously surpass the 78%. Sure. It's going to go past that. So for me, I have relative comfort in my income and the enjoyment I get from my job. I actually work with my close friends as well. One of the guys that uh, I, I work with, I was groomsman for at his wedding. He lives in uh, Gloucester and Cheltenham, but we spend a lot of time talking. If he wasn't there, then maybe the job would be more arduous. It would hurt a little bit more. I would have a bit more pain. I would have a bit more discomfort. Maybe if I didn't hit my target next year, which obviously I'm going to do, yeah, I, I'd be fiscally a little bit more hurt. So I'd be like, right, fuck, maybe I should pursue this a little bit more. So I, 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 I honestly, this is one of the most difficult considerations for me uh, that I have, but I'm not naturally entrepreneurial. Yeah. But I've put myself in a position where I have a lot of leverage that I could turn into businesses based on the value that I've given over the years, based on the platforms that I've built. And that's something that's going to continue to be a consideration. And I owe it to myself and potentially pushing beyond even the, the wealth that I can generate from my income uh, in my corporate career to, to do something myself as well. It's amazing because the difference between you and anyone else in a nine to five job is any time you have outside of those hours, you're grafting like a motherfucker to make something outside of it. A lot of people in a nine to five use that comfortability to be complacent and lazy and fucking do nothing outside of it. Trouble to switch off, Jack. Yeah, so there's there's such a big, yeah, but that's such a powerful thing because you're not letting the comfortability of your nine to five fuck you up in a way that you're not moving forward in other ways. Do you know what I mean? You're allowing that to then optimize the headspace towards other things, which is fucking mental. Yeah. One of the, the only person I've actually met in like a nine to five job that has that, the, the way of acting is fucking, it's insane, man. Big respect to you, man. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, there's nothing negative to have in a, a nine to five job, but... If you do what Cole does. Yeah, if you, yeah but even at that... Sa like, sa sales is one of the best jobs you can do for fulfillment compared to a lot of other jobs because you can directly measure your impact. Yeah. And it's that's much more fulfilling than if you're just a really small cog in a wheel. Yep. And that's not to say that every sales job I've worked has been perfect, but the one that I'm in just now, I can clearly see the role that I'm playing and the part that I've been on that journey. And I bought into coming and doing that journey. We're two years in. Next year may not be as be as exciting as fulfilling because I might go from three to three point eight to to four in a bit, and I'll be like, oh, well, I wasn't as exciting. <laughs> yeah. But but you need to buy into the process and enjoy the journey. And I think any young guy that's feeling a little bit lost that isn't quite sure about businesses go and do a sales job because any business that i launch off the back of that i'm going to be selling the product to the service yeah and i've got a good a good, a good sales background off the back yeah. of that as well it's very important but something that we did mention in the first podcast that uh happiness is subjective so although yes you are a nine-to-five job but you're doing all this other extra stuff and at some point you're going to be very 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 successful financially regardless of the corporate job like i believe that you probably will have more things other than the corporate job because that is your plans but happiness is subjective so again we're sitting you're talking about millionaires uh he's been to multi-millionaires jack's got multi-millionaire clients but you might not want that so don't feel obliged to fucking try and reach that level because to be honest it's very fucking hard to get there you genuinely need to do work every single day how many people do that not a lot okay so if you're gonna sit and feel discouraged and feel like what you've got isn't enough because you're not a multi-millionaire it's fucking silly because you can still find happiness and there's uh, something i want to ask call in a minute you can still f find happiness from the simple things in life if that genuinely makes you happy but that's where you need to self-reflect and ask yourself do they right and if the answer is yes live your fucking life because as i mentioned as well you're gonna fucking die at some point so you may as well be content with what you've got if it genuinely makes you happy one little thing i want to get you to do right now right I've seen this on a diary of a ceo podcast guys fucking amazing it was a doctor uh, asian guy i just can't remember his name right but it was if i was to ask you this question right now what are three things in life right now that give you core happiness three things right now in your life if you were to like just think about that training and looking after my body feels amazing gives me core happiness i'll i'll leave the gym happy fulfilled stimulated conversations about ideas that i'm passionate about so i get to do that with the podcast Hold i get it. to do that with my friend group that uh, i spend time with as well number three unpressured time with family so i'm very fortunate that my mom and dad are still with ian and i in their 70s and they're incredibly important to 
both of us, they're formative in our upbringing and they still play a very big role in our day-to-day life now as well. They live really close to, to my flat as well. They even helped me out in my car today, as you guys maybe saw. Yeah, yeah. And time with them when it's not under pressure is really important. By that, I mean that you're not in a rush to get away. Yep. You're not in a rush to do the next thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I drop in 20 minutes before I'm going to go to the gym and meet a friend. That's maybe a little bit under pressure. But I've given myself 20 minutes to spend with my mum and just chat to her, which how many people my age or maybe a little bit older would kill for that time because their parents maybe aren't here or they aren't well or maybe they don't have the relationship that I've got with my family as well. So number three for me is like that kind of unpressured time with family. So see over Christmas, Christmas dinner. What's happening after that? Nothing. No. Well, I'm not rushing to the next thing. Yeah, we left and we went and, wa- and I went and watched the film at the house because my mum wouldn't want to watch the film that we'd want to watch. But, yeah, yeah. but we'd, ha- we'd had a fantastic time together and there was no pressure on us to do anything that was coming next there was no other thoughts that were coming up to be like oh christ i better go and send that email or i've got a team's call to go and jump on or i've got this to fit in that's really that's a real privilege and that's something i've learned from the podcast as well in particular friends that have had loved ones pass away and um, david mcintosh said this really poignant thing he's from uh, uh from air uh, and he's a local scottish podcaster he said delay gratification in every area except time with family Mm. time with loved ones because his, his mum passed away in 2020 and he was always optimizing for the take her to take her to new york for her 60th birthday 60th birthday never came yeah, that's, that's incredible so man. how much would she have traded the chance to go for another coffee go for another walk it's crazy the local cost she wouldn't give a shit she would have been happy so that that i mean that choked me up but like that for me is a really important value for me and yeah, i was okay. talking about my gratitude journal one of the things i write about a lot is the is the is the is the wealth of my well, like the health and wealth of my family in terms of their ability to support themselves and me for to me to support them as well and, and give me time and love and affection so the second part of the exercise is say you're really visualized right now you're lying on your deathbed your breath's getting shallow you're genuinely about to fucking die last thoughts in your head what are three things that you need to have done in your life to feel fulfilled and feel happy one work towards the potential that i know that i'm capable of Mm. and not leave a big delta between the man that i became and the man that i could have been Mm. number two be as present as possible in the time that i do have so we're talking there about um unpressured time with family just about dad gotta be present during Mm. that time like it's really easy like um we get notifications all the time see the guy that's replied to your instagram story with fire emoji because you've released a sick podcast that feels good. I promise you, it feels really good. Yep. But it's always going to be there. I'm going to keep putting out good podcasts, so they're going to keep replying to yeah, really sir, good. And yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate the fuck out of the support as well. But be in the moment that you're with somebody as well. I've got basically all my notifications about from WhatsApp off. Um, and when I'm with somebody I care about, I try and try and stay off my phone. And number three, in terms of stuff that I really want to make sure that I've uh, done, achieved potential presence. It could be one of the three that you just mentioned about like what makes yeah, you happy now. Yeah, I would say I would I would I would say ins- ensuring that ensuring that I gave myself the best possible chance to live the longest, healthiest life possible as well. Because I think you could live with modern medicine a kind of partial life for many many years at the end of your life. Yeah. Whether that's through operations or different medications or uh, different tools. But that's no life at all. Like I want to be healthy, fit, and able to enjoy my life and spend time with my future kids and grandkids as well, and be someone that's an active role model in in, the, in their lives as well. So that probably does align quite nicely. Yeah. So yeah. the purpose of the exercise is you might think right now these are the three things that make me happy right now. But if you actually think about when you're dying on your deathbed, those three things that would make you feel fulfilled is probably what you should be focused on right now to live a happy and fulfilled life. Do you know what I mean? So they actually did line up pretty quickly. I do. I've, I've well. done exercises similar to that. And I, I, I really feel like I've done the work to try and live in alignment with who I want to be. And know what makes you happy. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I, ch- I check in on myself with the journal at night. That's like, And it's not like, like some people are like, oh, dear diary. And you're like, okay, make fun of it. But, but they're if, running away from but, reflecting. Yeah, Reflecting is not comfortable. And when you reflect, things like that pop up. And then and to be honest with yourself. If you, if you reflect and think, right, on my deathbed, time with family is really important, but you've not seen your gran in fucking six months. That's uncomfortable because you know you've just been avoiding fucking going to see your gran. You probably picked to fucking go for food and talk shit with your pals over going to see your gran that's 80. You've probably got another three Christmases left. Do you know what I mean? So the reflection that you do on a daily basis, that's not comfortable. That's why people avoid it. It lets you check in and just just be sure that the actions are pushing you in the right direction. In the same way, if you guys said to me how important your business was, but 
you hadn't showed up on social media or you hadn't created a new podcast or you hadn't created a new product or a way of working with yourselves for months and months and months you'd be lying to yourself yeah, at, at that point in time and if you're never having those micro check-ins with yourself or with someone else then you don't give yourself the opportunity to check on that no, yeah 100%. it's amazing man anything else to add? yeah no so to finish off the podcast yep investments for 2024 where's your head at with that that's the investments and then your goals don't okay. fucking take what investments for let me speak cunt investments for 2024 where's your head at bro so i have a relatively broad asset allocation into stocks and shares which is primarily into what's called tracker funds mm. so that is funds that follow uh one is the s p 500 so that's the 500 biggest companies sure. in the us yep. so that's following that i have a global a uh, global equities fund so that's a uh, following different global stocks across the market as well i have a, that's so that's a monthly direct debit that goes into vanguard and it goes into hargreaves Lansdowne. those are just two brokerages that i can in, invest in yep. um and that's a that's a that's like a money comes out the account i don't notice it i don't know about it it's a percentage of my income that i'm happy with post tax that just goes in and in and in and it accumulates and then one day i'm going to look at it and hopefully it's 5 10 15 20 percent up and, and tens of thousands of pounds and hundreds of thousands of pounds are starting to accumulate and then that stacks and stacks and stacks other assets I invest in, uh, of course, crypto. Yes, sir. I've uh, done a number of different podcasts on that. My exposure in crypto is primarily to Bitcoin because I believe it's the daddy and it's the one that you should all be the most interested in holding, not financial advice, but it has the best use case behind it in terms of for the longer term. And for the crypto market to be a success, Bitcoin must go first. And that's a principle that you can learn about from different podcasts that I've done as well with the, the two gentlemen, Deck and Don from Crypto Glasgow. I do have exposure to some small altcoins within the market as well. One of those is XRP, which is a... Uh, it's basically a, 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 a transfer coin. It's it's how... Well, it's, Ripple, yeah. Ripple, exactly that. And it's basically the transfer of currency from country to country seamlessly, and it will play a big role in the future financial system. There's been a number of different legal challenges with it, yep. but I'm extremely bullish in its longer term price, but also its use case as well. So I'm holding a good amount of that. I hold a little bit of Ethereum, but not very much. Yep. And then my next, well, I think it's my third biggest holding is a coin called Borg. It used to be called CHSB. Yeah, it's yeah. Swiss Borg's native token. No token sorry swissborg is the app or wealth management exchange that i hold and buy my crypto on i have a ledger as well but i buy my crypto on swissborg and it is a brilliant exchange brilliant wealth management app and its coin is relatively low market cap at the moment but when the next bull run comes around and people start getting interested in crypto yep. i think swissborg will be one of the apps that a lot of people invest on and with that the token will get exposure to in the same way that binance coinbase have uh, coins that have relatively a uh, high value yep Swiss Borg is like one. Of, it's my kind of like it's my little it's my little one that can do 10, 50, 100x maybe. Don speaks about that a lot, doesn't he? Yeah, we're really really bullish on that one. So I, I hold a good amount of of Borg as well, and I use Swiss Borg for buying my crypto. So Sick. it shows I've got a lot of faith in that as well. The last thing I'll talk about is my brother and I own the property that we live in together. Yep. And I've always been interested in having a property portfolio if it could be not particularly time consuming crypto is not particularly time consuming it can be stressful but it's not time consuming so you yep. can just invest and in, in pull away whereas if i own two buy to lets i need to have either someone manage them i've got to find tenants i've got to make sure there's repairs etc 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 at this moment in time we have quite high interest rates in order to con control inflation sometimes high as eight ten twelve percent sometimes for mortgages which is really 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 high compared yep. to what they were previously i locked in at a, a just over one percent mortgage uh, for five years uh two two and a half years ago you can overpay your mortgage and that can allow you to chip away more at the interest rate as long as there's not a penalty please do check that so if you are a, if you are a homeowner and you benefited from a lower interest rate you can start to game the system a little bit in a time where the markets or inflation or interest rates are different so if interest rates are low that's not as beneficial but where interest rates are high and you've got a lower one you can benefit and get some of the end fee or sorry some of the uh, total amount owed on your mortgage down faster by overpaying but some mortgage providers will penalize you for that i personally don't have that so we've allocated a little bit more towards our mortgage during this period which we would never previously do in other market uh, terminologies and again i've learned all of this from the people that i've hosted on my show in particular andrew craig the author of how to own the world and the guy called pete matthew who's like the pod father of like personal uk finance oh uh, yeah and 
I, I've got access to like all these brilliant minds. Deck and Don from Crypto Glasgow, we spent a lot of time together. They've been in the show five times. But I've been able to get access to these guys and set my finances up in a way that I believe that future Colin, which we're all talking about, is, yep. is going to be looked after. To go back to crypto, it's crazy. I didn't really realize until watching the podcast with Deck and Don and yourself that crypto, a lot of different crypto coins, etc., is based on projects that people are building in the background. And then it, it gave me more perspective on crypto being more of a business orientated industry. So now I'm going to, after this pod, after talking to you and talk, seeing that podcast, I'm going to look to invest more into crypto, Bitcoin, all that kind of stuff, because it is more of a business orientated industry to get into when you start to look into the details of the projects people are building to build the, the price of the the coin all that kind of stuff it's interesting that there's actual integrity in those projects that you can some, start to base for the future off of which is the vital point there's is like, it perception there's, there's, like, there's like meme coins which can they build a fake perception almost yeah of course you can yeah uh, so there's a lot of pump and dumps so like coins will get hyped up and How would then, you distinguish between a legit coin with a good project behind it that's building and not? Do your research on what the coin stands See for. See them actually taking action on building that project. Yeah, yeah, exa exactly that. And they'll, there's there's literal white papers on every single project, or there should be, to okay. understand what they're doing. You can follow their social media channels closely. And of course, shortcut, you can engage with guys like Crypto Glasgow who do this analysis for you. You yeah, can give you the stuff and start sauce, to understand yeah. that as well, which is so, so vital because it's really easy to be swept along in the next crazier phase and like yeah. the for example the the paul brothers got in quite a lot of trouble for pumping up a coin and then people were in they managed to move the price enough and then people who were holding from like the early days when it was worth a lot or worth very little sold and pulled out that, that happens a lot there's a lot of social media influencers who are paid to pump low market cap coins up and then pull the rug Profit, and, and, then get, and then you're left holding the bag when it's gonna be it's never gonna get back up to that level again Fun fact, in 2013, if you were to hold Bitcoin until now, you would have a 5.9 thousand percent gain. So it's crazy to think that... It's an, ama it's an amazing asset class. It's crazy. I've held it since 2020. I was down for long, long periods. I'm about 155% up. Jeez, we up, baby. Moment. Yeah. Come on. Because I stayed resolute to the project and I understood it and I bought in and averaged in across a period. So dollar cost averaging or pound cost averaging is what I'm doing with my stocks and shares. Cool. I'm buying in on a regular basis regardless of the price. One week, Bitcoin's 44,000. I'm putting in 200 pounds. One week, Bitcoin's 48,000. I'm putting in 200 pounds. One week, it's 16,000. I'm putting in 200 pounds. On the week, I put in 200 pounds at 16,000. I'm obviously accumulating more, more of a coin, for sure. yep. but I'm accumulating less when it's higher. But over a period, you get a thing called smoothing, yep. which enables you to accumulate more and more and more across the price, and you're not as affected by it psychologically. It will surpass the price points that you've bought in at after a period well, of that's time. That's the plan. That's for the sure. Plan. Not every asset will, but I'm hopeful Bitcoin will. Yeah, 100%. Like, I feel like Bitcoin as well, when it comes to digital currency, they're obviously trying to make Bitcoin an ETF. Not too much sure what that is, but it doesn't sound too good when ETFs it comes to... What, ETFs are what I'm buying into. So see the some of the tracker funds that I've got on yep. Hargreaves Lands and Vanguard? They're like ETFs. They're like um, like funded accounts that are traded by these huge... Heavily regulated, though, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They are. They are. Obviously, Bitcoin isn't, is it? It's decentralized. Decentralized, uh, sorry. So. so it's not a bad thing if Bitcoin becomes part of it, but... It, it just means that... Can it be controlled still, more, though? For, uh, no, no, it won't. it'll just be part of the asset allocation. So at the moment, those funds are buying stuff like stocks, shares, equity, bonds. Oh, okay. They're buying gold, they're buying silver. They all just form part of the asset allocation. But that ETF is saying, we want some exposure to Bitcoin as well. So the, out of the 10 billion that's within that fund, probably more, they're maybe going to spend like 0.5 billion on some Bitcoin within that fund. So you get exposure to it as well. Because the guys that are investing in that fund, they're like, we want to get some of that action. Okay. We want more exposure to, in the same way they might want more exposure to oil or they want more exposure to gold or they want more exposure to Tesla or whatever stock it is. It's all just like the asset allocation within it. Yeah. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty fucking motivated to get up and go and smash the fuck out of my life. So we'll end it at that. It's been about two hours. This will probably get cut into two parts. Um, but yeah, a lot of wisdom to take. I'm going to rewatch this podcast because of how much was spoken. I'm taking notes on this shit. I'm taking notes on our own fucking podcast, I'll tell you that. Um, but yeah, hope you guys all enjoyed. Just want to say thank you to Carl for your time and attention, bro. Fucking really, really appreciate it. Obviously, oh, forever grateful. Doing, do you know what I mean? So coming and giving us, what, two hours of your wisdom is fucking really valuable. And everyone that's watching this again, going back to the purpose of why we're fucking doing this podcast, we're not going to bring on 
a junkie to sit and talk about taking like we're actually wanting people to benefit from this podcast so if you've not taken one fra- one thing away from this you've not listened to it okay because there's been a lot of fucking wisdom a lot of relatable stuff as well doesn't matter if you want to be a millionaire or you want to just live a simple life some of the things in this podcast can make your life better so yeah thanks again Carl. Fucking gents legends. absolute pleasure thank you for having me thank you for me having me as your your first guest and i'm looking forward to where you take the show so episode four let me do this bit episode four we're gonna have one of the most dangerous fighters in the world do we name him the king of the north king of the north nico carillo um going to be the champion in a very short space of time 2024 fucking nutter absolute dangerous motherfucker so episode four will be him on the show if you've listened to this fucking length of podcast we love and appreciate you and there's gonna be a lot more of this a lot more value a lot more wisdom and if you don't as i said before if you do not benefit at all from these podcasts message me and jack we'll both give you a thousand pounds each because i i'm in denial that you're not gonna fucking benefit at all so yeah, have a good night, have a good day, whatever, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And yeah, we love and appreciate you. And if you took one piece of wisdom from this podcast, from what Cole said, he has a podcast, Canberra Conversations, fucking amazing, hundreds of po- episodes that I'm working my way through right now. Um, but yeah, see you on episode four. See you later, motherfucker.